You all may be seated. God bless you, and let's welcome to the uh, platform here, Shram, tonight. Can we all welcome him, please? Well, what an honor to be here with you guys tonight, to be back in this area. It's been a few months since we've been um, over here, and recently my, uh, my family and I actually moved out to the Spokane area, but uh, the Lord uh, keeps us busy by allowing us to travel um, around Washington State and uh, across the country, and so we have um, such great friends here in uh, the Squim Port Angeles area. I see some in the audience here. I know some of you uh, were supportive also when I ran for governor, and so thank you guys for that, and um, what a privilege. Uh, we're gonna get into this presentation tonight just because there's a lot to cover, and uh, I would love to have a little bit of time at the end where we can um, allow you guys to ask some questions, because I'm sure there'll be some questions <laughs> that will be there, and so we'll have a mic that will pass around, and we'll uh, be able to answer some questions, hopefully. Um, and I wanna start out by saying that I'm grateful to the Lord for the privilege it is to be here. I thank uh, your pastor um, and the leadership here uh, of this body for opening their doors. I, I will tell you that I don't get nowadays a lot of invitations into churches. And I think when, you'll, um, when you hear the presentation and you'll, you'll kind of see um, the truth that we're going to share tonight about Islam and, and my story, my journey of coming to the Lord, um, perhaps you'll understand why. Unfortunately, I think that we have some churches that um, are trying to embrace Islam uh, in, in, a, in a maybe a uh, very misled way of reaching out to Muslims. And then we have some churches that um, don't want to go there because it's too controversial or it's too confrontational or whatever it might be. And of course, some churches, as somebody just mentioned, have already embraced the whole concept of Chris Long, the idea that, oh, we have a common God and a common word. And of course, this is just a blatant lie. And I will share, you that, share with you that tonight in my testimony. I want to get started here just telling you a little bit about our ministry, the Truth and Love Project. It's a very simple mission. And I, it's a biblical mission because the Bible commands us to speak the truth in love. I, I've, I've challenged people in love to say, show me the verse in the, in the Bible that says I can be politically correct. If you guys find that verse, will you please email it to me? Because I'm still looking. I see everything in scriptures that says that we're supposed to be bold for the truth. Speaking the truth in love. And if I give you Ephesians chapter 4, which is uh, where that, that verse comes from uh, for us in our ministry... Um, the Apostle Paul says that because he just said in a couple of verses earlier, he doesn't want us and the Lord doesn't want us to be like little children that are tossed about by the waves of scheming men, deceit, trickery, false teaching. And so we're in a grave time, aren't we, where there's a lot of deception out there and we are commanded, particularly as Christians, to speak the truth in love. And the truth is what sets us free. Amen. The truth will, shall set you free. And that's what you heard tonight too as I intersperse my testimony throughout this presentation that it was the Lord, it was the truth that set me free. It wasn't um, a feel-good message, by the way. The gospel offends, doesn't it? But it does its job if we allow it to do its job, if we simply trust in the power of God. So our ministry is committed to speaking the truth in love on various issues. And obviously, the main thing that I speak on is Islam because of my background as a former Muslim. Uh, but we also address other issues that are dealing with in, in our nation. Um, our website, by the way, uh, we have information on our back table. If you guys are interested in following our website, it's just tilproject.com, uh, truthandloveproject.com, just tillproject.com. And we'll give you some more information at the end. Now, some of the things that I do address also are dealing specifically in the church. Um, like, for example, a presentation that I recently done that I have DVDs of that is e addressing the issue of Chris Long. Because this is becoming a more growing issue in many of our churches where missionaries and pastors are believing. They're starting to believe this notion that, well, yeah, maybe we do have a common God. And maybe we do have a common word. And maybe we all come from the same place. And I'm here to tell you that that is absolutely not true. There is nothing common between Islam and Christianity, nothing other than God loves the lost and wants to rescue them out of darkness. So, but tonight's presentation, again, I'm also going to be covering the, the topics 
of how Islam is affecting our nation, how Islam is affecting the world. Anybody think it's a growing issue? Right? And isn't it amazing that every time an attack, like how many of you guys obviously watched what happened in Australia? You know, and, and it's easy. Well, that, that doesn't reflect Islam. That's not Islam. That, that was just a crazed guy that went nuts. How many of you know and remember that just recently in America, we had our first beheading in Moore, Oklahoma, of all places. In a little place, Moore, Oklahoma, in the middle of the Bible Belt. 53, 54 year old grandmother gets beheaded at work by a guy that was converted to Islam in prison. And yet our government has deemed it another workplace violence. Had nothing to do with Islam. Of course, they forget to tell people that the second gal almost got beheaded had it not been for somebody at work, the plant manager, who happened to have a gun and stopped the attacker. So we have a lot of stuff going on and um, it's imperative that we speak the truth. I want to share with you just briefly about my background. Some of you may know or may not know, but just for those of you who don't know, just a little bit my, about my biography, so to speak. I was born in Iran, so we left there in 1978. And we left actually before the, before the revolution happened, um, which was really an overthrow, right? They overthrew the government. Uh, and my dad used to be in the military under the Shah, and we left six, less than six weeks, about five and a half weeks before the government fell. And of course, not knowing at the time that it was gonna fall. We just had a sense of urgency to get out. We left everything behind, literally just packed our suitcases, caught the first flight out. And less than six weeks later, as I said, the government was overthrown. The Shah was ousted. Ayatollah Khomeini came in. Um, unfortunately, with the help of the American government, if those of you remember when President Carter um, sort of turned his back on the Shah and, uh, and supported that move, and so I grew up watching my birth country go to the hands of Islam. Iran became an Islamic theocracy. The government was established under Islamic law, which is called Sharia law, which I'll talk about later. And uh, it became an Islamic theocracy. There is, remember in Islam, there is no separation of, of, of mosque and state. And so I witnessed that. I witnessed my birth country. I saw it. So by the grace of God, when we came to the United States, um, I came here because of the freedom uh, and, and praise God for the freedom that this nation has had, um, although we're losing it very rapidly. So I, I'm proud to call this my home. This is my nation, uh, you know, becoming a citizen. But I'm also so grieved at where our nation is headed and how rapidly and how fast and the role that Islam is playing in that demise, in my opinion. So we have to address those issues. I'll talk about it more tonight. Um, of course, the biggest change happened in my life 15 years ago, about 15 and a half years ago, when I became a follower of Jesus Christ. And as I said, tonight during this presentation, I will intersperse parts of my testimony. But I want to cover one specific thing. I, growing up in Iran, I, I was more culturally Muslim. Um, yet it was interesting that when I became a Christian and on day three, literally on day three, when I became a Christian, I told my parents because I was so excited. And on day three, my dad disowned me. Now, fortunately, he didn't want to kill me. Because if you, if you guys understand, and we'll cover some of the teachings of Islam, by the teachings of the prophet of Islam himself, I'm an apostate. I'm one who's left the faith and deserves the death penalty. So fortunately, they didn't want to kill me, but they did disown me. And my dad was utterly disappointed. I remember asking him, dad, you, you never even followed Islam. How many times have you gone to the mosque in your life? Well, it doesn't matter, son, because you've, you've disgraced your family. You've, 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 you've disowned our culture. And of course, that was the furthest thing from the truth because I believe the Lord gave me a greater heart for Muslims and for the lost and my own culture in Iran than before I was a Christian. And please remember that Iranians are not Arabs. I know some people get confused about that. We're Persian. You may hear some Iranians say, we're not... Iranian, we're Persian. <laughs> and of course, biblically, Persia has a good heritage, at least to some extent, doesn't it? God seemed to use Persia a few times um, to rescue Israel. And so uh, I always try to remind people of that. Like, hey, uh, pray for those Persians because they may come in handy in these days ahead. You know, um, we may need some Persians again. Um, but my dad disowned me. My family disowned me. Now, by the grace of God, that relationship was somewhat restored after a number of years. But I share that with you to say that, again, you know, for me, it was counting the cost. It was knowing that this was where 
the truth was and to follow the truth. But when I grew up, I asked my parents many times, how, if I die tomorrow, and I don't know if any of you have thought about that question recently. If I were to die today, forget tomorrow, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Where do I go? And I remember their answer to me was, well, you know, Allah is fair. It's up to him. I go, well, that's not good enough. Because how do I know? Because what if I die? I get to Allah. Allah goes, sorry. See, because in Islam, they teach you that it's this good and bad thing. You do good, you do bad, you do good, you do bad. It's the scale. And so all these Muslims are walking around like they know what they're doing. And really, they don't. They're so lost. And we in the church, instead of telling them the truth, we're telling them they worship the same God. What the heck are we doing? We should be telling them who the true God is. And so... This good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. I thought, man, what if I die and then I've just done a little bit more bad than good? There's no guarantee of salvation. Except I was taught one. Which I'll show you tonight is completely scripturally correct when it comes to Islamic teaching. Which is that you must become a martyr. If you die for Allah, you get to go to paradise. I thought, well, I don't want to die. I like life. So I thought I have a problem because really I'm not a good Muslim. If I'm not willing to die for Allah, I'm not a good Muslim. I wasn't a good Muslim. And I witnessed in Iran some of my distant relatives, two of my cousins, sacrifice their lives because of this teaching. How many of you remember that Iran was at war with Iraq for eight years in the 1980s? And when the army would go, there was always minefields. And they lose a lot of men in these minefields. So the Iranian government comes up with this brilliant scheme. And it's easy to go, oh, well, that's, that's just the Iranian government. That's not Islam. But it comes out of Islam. And that is that if you become a martyr, if, 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 if families allow their children, their young boys, to march into the minefields and blow up for the sake of Allah, then they go to paradise. And not only do they go to paradise, but the family gets saved. Again, I'll show you. That's scripturally Islamic. Collective salvation. So I had two of my cousins who their parents sacrificed them. They would give them those little headbands. They said, there's no God but Allah and his prophet Muhammad. And a little chain around their neck with a little key on it. And that was supposed to be the key of paradise. And they'd march him into the minefields. And then once they blew up, the army would go, don't go that way, go this way. And so I witnessed that growing up. So I remember thinking, if that's God... I don't have anything to do with that God. If Allah is God, I'm done. And I grew up more agnostic in my 20s than I did believing in anything. Because I thought, that's not the God I want to follow. You know what? Thank God he's not God. Thank God he's not the true God. And thank God that somebody had the courage 15 and a half years ago to risk offending me. Please hear what I'm saying. They had the courage to risk offending me with the gospel. Because it does offend. It did hurt. It did challenge what I was taught. Man, a, God became a man? What? He died on a cross? What? Yes. All those things are true. But it offended me. And thank God that person had the courage to continue with the truth. And not back down. Not be afraid. Because that offense was really the Holy Spirit breaking my heart. And bringing me into the kingdom of God. Now, I want to go move on with our presentation. As I said, I'll share other parts of my testimony. But remember, Muslims have no guarantee of salvation. You should be thinking, I wonder why they're so committed to dying. Right? Why are they so committed to dying? Because they have no guarantee of salvation. Except if they become a martyr. And I'll share with you the verses. Okay, hang on to that. Now... I'm a pastor, so right after I became a Christian, within nine months, the Lord called me to Bible college, and praise God, and I became a pastor. I've been a pastor for almost 13 years now. Um, I currently pastor a church called Truth and Love Christian Fellowship. We've been meeting, we've been, we started seven years ago, and we just actually launched our second location out in Spokane, which is why we're over there, and we have our body in Everett as well, and I'll actually be visiting them this Sunday. Um, I was a former police officer. God took me through a journey. Uh, being, a, being a police officer in the city of Redmond. I've been a teacher. I've been a coach, business, a small business owner, a lot of different journeys. And of course, as I mentioned, some of you may remember 
uh, this campaign for governor thing. Uh, that <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but it was an amazing, amazing uh, journey to run for governor, and that was a calling of God. There was no way I would have ever thought about doing that on my own. Um, and I thank you for those of you in this room who supported us, and, and um, um, it was it was amazing. And, and I believe that we brought truth, and um, I, I believe that that's still there's still ramifications of that truth that is impacting the state. But God will get His way, and um, I just pray that we are not of the people who will compromise uh, for the sake of political expediency. I saw too much of that in the campaign, and it broke my heart. This whole Lester of two evils business has got to stop. And we have to be willing to stand for truth and for our right principles. Now, tonight's presentation, Islam's true goal and Islam's threat to liberty. This is kind of a hybrid that I'm doing, special, especially for you guys tonight, because it's sort of mixing. Um, there's a presentation that I have called The True Goal of Islam and the Threat of Sharia Law. The, there's a new presentation that I'm focusing on with Islam's threat to liberty. That's kind of part two to this presentation here. But um, it's not videotaped yet, so tonight is sort of a, a, a mix. It's a hybrid, uh, especially for this group. But um, we will have those other presentations you know, uh, on DVD soon uh, as we follow up. Because, of course, this issue with Islam is not going away. It's just growing and expanding. It's going to be more in our faces, and we better be prepared to deal with it. And, and if we're not, and some don't want to, especially some churches, um, we're going to be, uh, we're going to have many, many problems. But again, thank you, God, for this body. Now, uh, I want to cover a, so just a little basic Islam 101 because, um, you know, I want, people accuse me of putting out misinformation. People accuse me of being an Islamophobe. You guys have heard that term before? Yeah. An Islamophobe. In fact, the Council on American Islamic Relations, that's a front group for the Muslim Brotherhood, CARE, CARE um, put out a press release when I was running for governor and called me the Islamophobic candidate for governor. I thought, what a wonderful thing they did, CARE. Um, but what is Islamophobia? What is phobia? The idea of phobia, this, this sort of irrational fear, uh, is it valid to have a concern and a fear about Islam and its ideology? Yeah. Or is it that we're just fear-mongering and we're just traveling around and we're all just a bunch of haters? Because I've been accused of all that. And so because of that, I want to cover a little basic Islam 101 just so that they don't accuse me of, of, of misinformation. Okay? So as a Muslim, they are commanded to follow in the way of Allah. This is one of the verses in the Quran. Uh, and I'll talk about the sources from Islam. There's three main sources. The, well, you guys say Quran, sorry, but it's Quran because it's with, usually it's actually with a Q. But I know in the West you say Quran. So the Quran, the Quran, the Quran, same thing, okay? That's supposed to be their, their, their holy inspired book. The, it's supposed to be dictated by the angel Gabriel, they believe. Well, I mean, now remember, this is only according to the prophet of, of Islam, Muhammad. Because there was no witnesses. There's, there's never been any eyewitnesses. None of this was recorded in history. So this is only going based on his testimony. So almost 1.7 billion people in the world are following a guy that is dead. And nobody was eyewitness to anything he saw. And now some of our churches are beginning to embrace it as well. I mean, this is how, this is how amazing and ridiculous we're, we're in in this hour. But they're commanded to follow Allah in his way. In the Chris Lam DVD, I go very adamantly refuting that Allah is not Jehovah God. Allah is not the same God as the Bible. It, it is a ludicrous statement. And unfortunately, as I said... I am now fighting many missionary organizations in the church. In fact, people like myself and other former Muslims who refuse to go down this road of Allah is Jehovah, Allah is the God of the Bible, we are now sort of being pushed to the fringe. We're, 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 we're over here, we're the weirdos. We're, we're, just, we're, not, we're not evolving and, and, and moving along with time. But you know what? The gospel doesn't evolve. The gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't, doesn't evolve. God is the same yesterday, today, forever. When he came up with the gospel, it was for, for all men, for all seasons, for all generations. This notion that somehow we have to evolve the message of God to better fit our culture is nonsense. That's just us trying to compromise the truth. Because truth is truth. It's absolute, right? I mean, uh, either truth is truth or it's not. This notion that, you know, I hear this a lot too, particularly in, in the politics. You know, truth evolves. That's, that doesn't, statement doesn't make sense. 
Truth cannot evolve. Either it's truth or it's not. Particularly if it's God's truth. You either believe in divine truth or you don't. So they believe in the way of Allah. Now, there's five basic pillars of Islam. I just want to cover these really quick. These are five things that all Muslims are commanded to follow. Some of these are daily. For example, the Shahada, which I would never recommend you doing, because that's the prayer that they pray to become a Muslim. So please don't ever do that, okay? But the Shahada is the, is the prayer they pray to become a Muslim. Anybody that prays this prayer would become a Muslim. That's the headband that you see all the terrorist groups wearing, like ISIS. It's the Shahada. Okay, there's no God but Allah and His Prophet Muhammad. That's the Shahada. That's the prayer that they say. And I rebuke that prayer in the name of Jesus because it's not a prayer. Amen. Number two, the swan. This is their fasting. So Muslims fast, particularly during the month of Ramadan. I mean, if you heard of Ramadan, that's their holy month. And so they get up in the morning and from sun up to sundown, they're supposed to fast. At sundown, they break the fast, they have a big meal. And then at the end of the 40 days, it's called Eid al-Fitr. It's this big feast that they have. At the end of the 40th day, they have a big, huge meal. And apparently the White House has recently been celebrating Eid al-Fitr too. So they're having a big feast celebration down at the White House, celebrating the end of Ramadan. So the fast, the salat is their daily prayers. How many times are they supposed to pray? Five times, okay? Now there's a whole backstory behind that because apparently Muhammad argued with Allah because Allah wanted him to pray 30 times a day and then he negotiated with him down to five, apparently, according to <laughs> tradition. So they pray five times a day, but when they pray, they have to pray at least three times and it's very ritualistic. And then if you've seen them, they go up and down and they have to do this whole motion and they pray certain verses that many Muslims don't even know what they're praying. You know that only 15%, approximately, of the world's Muslim population are Arabs. Only 15%. Yet Arabic is the only language that Allah speaks. If you try to speak Chinese to Allah, he wouldn't understand you. I'm not trying to be facetious. This is just ridiculous. If you were African and you spoke an African dialect, he's not going to understand you. You're going to have to learn Arabic. And not just any Arabic, classical Arabic. And if you don't pray in the right accent, you're going to get in trouble. A good friend of mine who's from Iran, who's also a believer in Jesus Christ, his name is Mark, Pastor Mark. He actually has a testimony where he went to Mecca. And I'll talk about the Hajj in a minute, this holy pilgrimage. And it was at Mecca that he was told he wasn't praying properly. And there was a great punishment for him. So you have to pray your daily prayers. You have to learn Arabic and recite it. And it's like an incantation. It's like a chant. And I'll tell you later one of the things they pray. There's a verse they pray out of the Quran that actually denies the Trinity, denies the Father, denies the Son. And most Muslims don't even know they're praying it because all they're taught is just have, they just have to say the words. How sad is that? The zakat is their almsgiving. It's their giving. Now we think, well, that's fantastic. They give like we do. No, 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 because their giving only goes to Muslims. When a Muslim gives to the mosque, that money can never be used or is not supposed to be used for non-Muslims unless it's for dawah. Anybody know what dawah is? Dawah is their evangelism, is their proselytization. The only time that money can be used for a non-Muslim is if they're doing dawah, if they're trying to reach you to convert you to Islam. If you see Muslim charities, usually it's either for Muslims or it's a front group. The United Kingdom recently has been fighting and shutting down over 60 charities in the UK that are front groups for the Muslim Brotherhood. And for Islamists in UK, the, the, the charities are oftentimes front groups for very bad activity. And the largest terror financing trial in the United States, which happened in 2007, it was called the Holy Land Foundation, a charity that was funneling more than $12 million to Hamas. And CARE was a part of that. And you would not believe the statement that the President of the United States just made last week about the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm going to cover that later. I'm going to show you a little video of it. And finally, the Hajj, the fifth pillar. This is their once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to Mecca. Once-in-a-lifetime, Muslims are commanded to go to Mecca, to this place called the Kaaba, this black building there. And they're supposed to walk around that circumambulate seven times per day. They're supposed to be there as long as they can. And they believe that if they go to Mecca, and there's a black stone in the corner of the building, and if they touch that stone, which has a very sordid history, very um, pagan history, um, that maybe, maybe, no guarantee, maybe they'll go to heaven. Maybe Allah will forgive their sins. Remember, the only guarantee is martyrdom. Very good. Now, those are the five pillars. Those are accepted pillars. No Muslim can refute any of those pillars. 
To be a good Muslim, you're supposed to do these five things. There's a sixth unofficial pillar that most, most of us don't talk about because they want to deflect. And the sixth unofficial pillar is jihad. Now, Muslims will say, well, jihad is just a spiritual struggle. That's nonsense. There's a very small component of Islam that is spiritual. Most of Islam is practical. Most of Islam is governmental. It's civil. It's criminal. It's practical daily things that Muslims have to engage in. And all of that is jihad. Because what are they trying to do? They're trying to establish the way of Allah. And I'll explain to you the deeper goal of what the way of Allah is. But the word jihad comes from the word mujahada. That's the root. And mujahada is signifying warfare against the unbeliever. Or what the Quran calls the kafir. Or the kufar, which is plural. Now kafir is not a nice word. They will say to us, kafir just means infidel. Because you guys are all infidels. I'm an apostate. Anybody here a former Muslim? No? Okay, you're all infidels. Sorry. I'm an apostate. The infidel gets three choices. Convert to Islam. Pay the jizya, which is an extortion tax. the tax to protect you as a second class citizen. It's what's called dimi. Dimi too? You guys have heard that? Dimi. That's what ISIS is doing right now in places like Iraq and Syria. They're telling the Christians, if you don't want us to kill you, we may let you live. And you can maybe follow some of your religion, but you must pay us a tax, pay amounts of gold or money that you have based on your size, your family, how much money you have. And maybe we'll protect you. And maybe we won't. And maybe we'll just behead your children in front of you. Four Christian children under the age of 15 were just beheaded about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, in Iraq in front of their families because they would not denounce their Christian faith. Boy, I think as Christians in this country, we got to buck up a little bit. We got to pull up our pants a little bit and, and go, man, if they're going through that, we're blessed. I mean, we're blessed. And maybe we should take advantage of the opportunity we have and the freedom we have to proclaim the gospel boldly when we don't have a gun to our head or a sword to our neck. But the word mujahada comes from, or, or the word jihad comes from the word mujahada signifying warfare. Why? Because when you're dimmy, you're still an enemy. It's just they're protecting you for a while. Now, you guys know what option three is? War, which will lead to death. So either when you have war with Islam, either Islam wins or you win. There's no other middle ground. Those are the three choices that infidels have. The kufar or the kafir, singular kufar, plural, is a dirty word. It doesn't mean infidel. It means excrement. Forgive, forgive what I'm saying. I'm just reporting to you what it is. It means excrement. So when you hear Muslims call the non-believers a kufar, they're saying your stuff from the bathroom. Well, they will say it means infidel. That's what they claim it means. It's worse than infidel. Now, before I show you this quick video, and we're working on sound, right? We're ready to go for the sound. I want to cover this because, see, again, Muslims won't argue with that. But what Muslims will do, in fact, just today, I got a call from a friend of mine, a gentleman I know, in Moses Lake. You think Moses Lake? Pretty conservative area, right? Little town, Moses Lake. Well, apparently the college in Moses Lake just invited a young woman who's a Muslim to come and speak at the college. And he's trying to see if they'll let me come and speak. Because, you know, I'm just too controversial. <laughs> so the Muslim woman came and guess what she said about Islam? It's a peaceful religion. It's all about humanity and loving people and we want to get along. And oh, by the way, we have the same God. You Christians and us Muslims, we worship the same God at the college. And we pay for it based on our tax dollars. Isn't that wonderful? So now he's going to see, will they let me come and speak? I'll keep you up to date. I'll let you know if they let me come and speak. No, they haven't said no yet. He's still checking. But the, the, the one thing that, we have been, that has been shoved down our throats since 9-11 has been what? Islam is a religion of peace. Okay? Watch this video of some of our leaders, our highest leaders of our government. Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. Watch this video. So, pretty consistent, right, that we've been given this message after 9-11, really forced down our throats, that anybody who dares criticize the narrative of Islam being a religion of peace 
is then labeled as the Islamophobe, the hater. And the problem with this is that it's one thing in the culture, it's another thing in the church. Because it has silenced so many Christians and pastors in the church that we don't then engage this issue. The greatest mission field in the world are Muslims. And yet we're not truly engaging the issue because we're afraid of offending them. So we want to find a nice way of reaching them. There is no nice way. It's the truth. There's one way. And I'm not saying be mean. I'm saying let's do it in the truth. These guys, this is in England. The guy standing to his right in the black there, this guy named Anjum Chudri. Chudri and these guys have been labeled for years as extremists, radicals. Guess who's in charge of the Muslim groups in Europe now and in England? These guys. They're the ones who are taking over. Ten years ago, they were labeled as radicals, as fringe. Oh, they're perverting Islam, right? You heard it. They're perverting Islam. The question we have to answer is, is it the individual that perverts Islam or is it Islam that perverts the individual? You see, I am not here to bash Muslims. People accuse me all the time. You're a Muslim hater. No, I'm not. I love Muslims because the Lord loves Muslims. I believe God loves every person and wants to reach them and bring them into his kingdom. What I hate is the ideology of Islam. And I'm never going to be ashamed of that or make excuses for that. Because the ideology of Islam is what perverts the person. Because it's demonic. And that's what these guys, these, these guys sit out there for years. They've been saying the truth. The truth as in what they believe to be the truth. What I mean by that is they're not hiding. They're not giving you double talk. They just were telling you, listen, it's just a matter of time. Europe is going to be under the control of Islam. Sharia law is going to be the law of Europe. Europe will be taken over. In my Islam DVD, I have a demographics video that I show you. And the reality is that Europe becoming Arabia, it's just a matter of time. Simply because of what? Birth rate, immigration, marriages. And because the church has been asleep or comatose. So is there a peaceful Islam? Let's examine this really quick because I think you have to define the word Islamic peace. You see, words are important, aren't they? So in Islamic teaching, the word peace is defined this way. There's two components to it. One is when a nation becomes under the control of Allah, meaning predominantly Muslim. Now, that doesn't have to mean predominantly as in more than 50%. It means when they have control, when they have deemed that it's now in their hands. That's number one condition. Number two condition is the law of Allah, Sharia Allah, must be implemented into the government. So, go back to my own story. What is Iran today? A country of peace. You go, uh, Sharam, did you just lose your mind? Iran, a peaceful country? According to Islam, why? Because it's predominantly Muslim and it's governed by Sharia law. So we should be seeing peace abound. And yet we don't. We go, well, what's wrong with that picture? Because the definition of peace is warped, right? The Bible says that peace comes when we're made right with God. Islam says peace comes when everyone submits to Islam. That doesn't sound very peaceful to me. To force somebody against their will to submit to something that they don't want to submit to. Yet that's the definition of peace. You have to have these two parameters for a country to be deemed as now inviting the peace of Allah. Justice, social order, peace. Now my question is, are there not predominantly Muslim countries around the world that are governed by Islamic law and are predominantly Muslim? More than Iran, right? Just a few? There's 57 Muslim countries, or 56 plus Palestinian authority that are predominantly Muslim. And many of them like Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, uh, Turkey now, Iran, Afghanistan. These are countries that are governed by Sharia law. In fact, in Afghanistan, we helped them establish Sharia law. When we took out the Taliban in 2001, we put a government in there and they established a constitution under Sharia law. And now 10, 12, 12 years later, uh, the Taliban have taken over again. Any surprise? No, because we established Islam again. I'm not saying that we should have gone in there and established something else. I'm just saying that's what happened. So their definition of peace is very different than mine. 
The other problem with peace that you and I have to face in Islam is that Islam has two faces. There's the dualism. You go, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the problem is you can't trust the verses. Because Muslims in this country will stand up in front of you and I and say, Islam is a religion of peace. See, look at verse Surah chapter so-and-so says, there is no compulsion under Islam. We don't want to force you to become a Muslim. We just want to live side by side with you in peace and harmony and, and global unity and hold hands and hug and have tea and coffee together. And you go, well, that, but that's not what we're seeing in Muslim countries. That's not what we're seeing in Europe. Is there a disconnect? Nope. Well, you have to understand there's a dualism. And until we, the church in the West, understand this, we're not going to ever understand Islam. Why is there a dualism? Because the prophet of Islam had a dualism. What does that mean? That means that when he was in Mecca, in the early years of his life, he said, Allah gave him these verses. Remember, there's no witnesses. Nobody witnessed the verses. Nobody was test can, can give a testimony that they heard or saw him with the angel. In fact, according to the testimony of Muhammad himself, he thought he was demon-possessed. And he was going to go commit suicide off a cliff before somebody, his family and relatives, changed his mind and convinced him that he was hearing from God. This is in one of the hadiths. It's in one of the external documents in Islam that he said, woe to me. For I am possessed. I agree with him. <laughs> so then, once he gets these early verses that are not supposed to have compulsion. Well, the reason there was no compulsion is because he was a minority little speck in Mecca. They would have killed him. So he's going around saying, oh, no one's going to force you in Islam. Now, all of a sudden, he marries his wife, Khadija, becomes rich, becomes a warlord, starts raiding caravans, starts committing political assassinations. All of a sudden, now, he moves up to Medina, which is north, about 100 kilometers north of Mecca. Now it's called Medina. It used to be called Yathrib. It was named uh, after the prophet. The city, it's called the city of the prophets. And when he moves to Medina, all of a sudden, Muhammad claims, hey, you know what? I'm getting new verses from Allah. And those new verses say, now there is compulsion. Huh? Yeah, now, if they don't submit, they must die by the sword. And oh, by the way, I'll show you how it's done. You go, really? He did it himself? I will show it to you tonight. So everybody out there who says to you, including from the highest office of our land, that what you see these quote-unquote terrorists doing out there, by beheading people and killing people and raping people and pillaging people. Oh, that's not Islam. What if I were to show you that if the prophet of Islam did it himself, wouldn't that be Islam? Isn't that a fair statement? If Jesus Christ came and beheaded somebody, would you believe Jesus Christ? Would you say Jesus was a man of peace? Right? That would be a ridiculous argument. Yet Muhammad comes and beheads people. And orders the beheadings of, of his enemies. And we're going, this is a peaceful religion. Our nation has gone nuts. Is the church got their head on right? That's the question. Do we in the church, or do we have discernment and wisdom? So abrogation means what? Last thing I'm going to say, we'll move on. When? Here's the best way to understand it. When Muslims gain the upper hand, they are to now live by the latter verses. How do we know that? Because the question was asked of Allah. Allah, which verse do we follow? And Allah said, when you gain the upper hand, you are to live by the latter verses. That means when they don't have the upper hand, they can live by the early verses. There is a dualism or what we call abrogation. The early verses are abrogated, done away with for the latter verses. In fact, there are over 100 verses in the Quran that all of the latter verses, including Surah chapter 9, which I'll show you a couple of verses in a minute, that call for direct violence against not just anybody, but the people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Christians and Jews. So it's a specific target. They're not just tar targeting Hindus or, or uh, Buddhists or specifically Christians and Jews. You go, well, is Islam anti-Semitic? Oh, yes. 
Was the prophet anti-Semitic? Oh, yes. But we can't have honest dialogue. You see, if I went onto a college campus today and said that, they'd throw me out. In fact, I don't think they'd ever allow me in in the first place. If I went on TV and said that, I'd be labeled as the biggest bigot in the country, probably. What if I said that in some churches? Praise God, I'm here in this one. <laughs> Two houses. What does that mean? This goes with the abrogation. The best way to understand it is because there's abrogated verses, that established a doctrine in Islam which is called two houses. That means there's an early house and a latter house. The early house is called Dar al-Harb. It means the house of war. Harb means war. You're at war. They're at war. Remember in the way of Allah, jihad, they're at war. Now, it doesn't always mean they fight by the sword. Because there's something in the DVD on Islam, I cover this. There's something called cultural jihad. Which means better if we can come in the culture and change the culture from inside out. Why fight? Why blow ourselves up? Why fight by the sword if we can fight by other means? And in fact, in the, one of the documents that was seized from the Muslim Brotherhood, when a raid was done on them in 2004 by the FBI, in their own documents, it says, we're going to destroy Western civilization using their own miserable hands. They'll just use us to destroy ourselves. Because we'll go along with it because we don't want to offend anybody. Dar al Harb means house of war or some people translate it the house of the infidel. But really it's the house of war. That's what it means. Now what is Dar al-Islam? Anybody want to guess? House of Islam. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Dar al Harb, Dar al-Islam. How do they know what house they're in? When the call comes. Where does the call come from? The mosques. Who makes the call? The clerics, the imams, the mullahs, the religious leaders. Because in Islam, the average Muslim doesn't open the Quran and read it and gain understanding like we would believe in the Bible. The average Muslim has to go to the mosque and listen to the imam preach. And that's where they're going to get their understanding. So when the mosque starts saying, we are now in Dar al-Islam, the people, the followers are commanded now to live by the latter verses. That means they're going to start going around and telling non-Muslims... Particularly what two people? Jews. Jews and Christians. That you must submit. Well, what happened to the non-compulsive Islam? Oh, no, no. We're not in that house anymore. So my question to you is, well, it's pretty obvious what, what the Middle East is, right? Most of the Middle East is Dar al-Islam. What's Europe? Anybody want to guess? What's Europe? At this time. What are the mosques saying out of Europe? What do you think? They're saying they're the house of Islam. The imams in the mosques in Europe are declaring Europe is theirs. That it is Dar al-Islam. They've gotten the upper hand. That's why you see these kind of rallies on the streets and they're not hiding what they're doing. They're now very bold and very in your face because why? They're in the latter house. No more lying. No more hiding. Just say it the way it is. Oh, you non-Muslims, you got your choices now. Remember those three choices? Two houses. We'll cover that more in a minute. Now, when we talk about the peaceful Islam, as I said earlier, the question always comes up, well, you know, yeah, but these, these radical terrorists, they're, they're perverting Islam, right? And when they say the name of Muhammad, you know what Muslims are supposed to say when they say Muhammad's name? There's a phrase they say, like it's some sort of chant. They say, peace be upon him. Anybody heard that? You watch a Muslim, you watch a video, you watch anybody speak. Any Muslim cleric speaking, every time they say the name of Muhammad, interestingly enough, they don't say it very often when they say Allah, but they're commanded to say it when they say the prophet's name. You go, well, that's weird. The prophet seems to have more esteem than even Allah does. But when they say it, they say, peace be upon him. So my question is, is he a peaceful prophet? First of all, has Muhammad shown that he can be a prophet? Because if you look at Actual, and this is, I'm getting off track here just a little bit, but, but, but just think about this and, and maybe at the, at, if anybody has a, a question in the Q&A, if we have time, we can address this. Muhammad claimed to be a prophet. Nobody testified that he's a prophet. In the Bible, every prophet was backed up by some aspect of signs and wonders. And usually if they're wrong, they were not a prophet, right? High standard, right? Muhammad gets lots of things wrong, even in the Quran. And yet we still call him a prophet. And the Muslims say, peace be upon him. 
So was he a peaceful prophet? Question, is Muhammad central to Islam? Yes. Everybody shake their heads, yes. Over 86% of all of the texts in Islam, the Quran, and there's two other sources, they're called the Hadith and the Sirah. The Hadith are thousands of, of, of written words of biography. It's, it's like what he did. And the Sirahs are his sayings, expressions. So you put that together and it's called the Sunnah or the practice. So when a Muslim looks at the Quran and says, oh, I don't really know what I should do. What do they do? They turn to the Sunnah, to these other sources and go, what did Muhammad do? Just like we would maybe say as Christians, what did Jesus do? What would Muhammad do? And then they see Muhammad and that's now their, their, their guideline. So is he central? Yes, 86% of all the writings of Islam are about Muhammad. Remember, nobody else got the revelation but Muhammad. Nobody else witnessed the revelation but Muhammad. And Muhammad believes it was Gabriel. Remember the same angel that showed up to Mary? Here we are at Christmas time. Supposed to be celebrating the birth of the Messiah. Islam believes that that same angel that showed up to Mary 600 years before Muhammad was born. And said, this is God, Emmanuel, God with us, shows up to Muhammad and gives him a counter argument. And says, oh, those Christians are wrong. Jesus was never God or the son of God or died on the cross or was resurrected. He's simply a prophet. Peace be upon him. Because they'll say that about Jesus as well. So is Muhammad central? Yes. Is Muhammad to be imitated? Yes. Over 93 times, 93 times in the Quran, it says that they're supposed to follow Muhammad's example. Did Muhammad do the following? Did he lie? Yes. Did he deceive his enemies? Yes. Did he order the killing of apostates, those who left Islam? Yes. The teaching of killing apostates comes directly from the hadith of what the prophet himself said. That one of the three conditions for killing somebody, one of them is apostasy, when they've left the faith. Did he take sex slaves and child brides? Yes, he had over 15 wives when Muslims are only allowed to have four. What's up with him? Why is he extra special? And do you know that one of his brides was a nine-year-old? Well, six when they got married, Aisha. I'm not making this stuff up and I'm not trying to be inflammatory. This is the truth. And nobody wants to look at it. Did he order and participate in beheadings? The answer is going to be yes. You'll see. Okay. So if Muhammad these, did, did these things, then how can he be a prophet, number one? How can he be a peaceful prophet, number two? And how can Islam be peaceful? So my question, if I can show you tonight that he did these things... Is it case closed that Islam is peaceful? Yeah. Is it ca case closed that Islam is not true? That it's not of God? Yeah. I hope so, but the problem is it's not. Because even when I present this evidence, there's people who want to refute it. There may be peaceful Muslims, but there's no such thing as a peaceful Islam. A peaceful Muslim is one who is choosing not to follow Islam. There may be moderate Muslims, but there's no such thing as a moderate Islam. You see the difference here? You see, we're trying to separate a Muslim from the ideology. Because there's many Muslims I've talked to that never even read the Quran. Not once. How many Christians have you talked to that have never read the Bible? Quite a few. They say I'm Christian because I was born in America. What well, doesn't make you a Christian just like it doesn't make you a Muslim to be born in Iran. But that's what they believe. <laughs> so many Muslims I talk to, well, I don't, I don't really follow that stuff. I don't really. Okay, then you're not a good Muslim. You may think you're a Muslim, but you're not a good, devout Muslim. And so is there a moderate Islam? No, because Islam is in those two houses. There's no middle ground. It's either in the house of war or it's in the house of Islam. And if you're in the house of Islam, there is no middle ground. You submit or you're at war. There's only one Islam, the Islam of Muhammad and the Islam of Allah. And as I said earlier, 93 times in the Quran, Every Muslim is commanded, commanded, it's called deen, D-E-E-N, a commandment of Allah to imitate Muhammad. So if Muhammad 
is violent, if Muhammad is a liar, if Muhammad is a deceiver, if Muhammad is a pedophile, if Muhammad raped and pillaged and murdered and committed mass genocide, how on earth can Islam be those things? And how on earth can we be sitting here today saying what ISIS is doing is not Islamic? The president just recently had a briefing with several high-level uh, military personnel in the Pentagon. And he blew his lid because they were trying to equate ISIS with Islam. And he told them directly, I am offended. This is wrong that you're blanketing Muslims and tying them to Islam. Why would he be saying that? Remember the two houses? We're going to get to that. Remember the two houses? Here's a couple of verses. Surah chapter 9 is believed to be the last chapter given to the prophet according to the prophet. Because remember, nobody witnessed it. Okay, so Surah 9. But when the forbidden months are past, particularly Ramadan, that's the forbidden month. Right? They're, they're supposed to not be killing in the month of Ramadan. They don't always follow that. Then fight and slay the pagans, the infidels. That's all of you. Uh, whenever, wherever you find them and seize them, beleaguer them. Beleaguer them. You know, what does that mean? I mean, that means just frustrate them in every way you can. Draw it out. Make it prolong. And lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war. But, here's how you get out of it. If they repent and establish regular prayers and practice regular charity, <clears throat> that means the five pillars. Remember we talked about prayers, fasting, giving. <clears throat> then, because remember, the repentance comes by saying the shahada. So if you want to repent to Islam... I wouldn't recommend. You said the shahada. Then you got to practice the almsgiving, the you know prayer, fasting, and your giving. And then once in a life, once in your lifetime, you're supposed to go to Mecca. Make sense? If they do these things, then open the way for them. So do you see how this is a is this compulsion or not? Yeah. You understand? There's no option here. Correct? The Muslim is commanded make war with the infidels. Unless they do what? Submit. If they submit, leave them alone. If they don't submit, don't leave them alone. That sounds like compulsion to me. That sounds like force to me. Here's another verse. It's later in the chapter, Surah 929. Fight those who do not believe in Allah and the last day. And specifically, look at this. Fight the people of the book. That's a specific target on Jews and Christians. Who do not accept the religion of truth, Islam, until they pay tribute. The tribute is jizya, that, that tax that they have to pay. So what I'm just trying to show you is, this is the last chapter believed to be given to Muhammad. The last verses believed to be given to Muhammad. And this is where the question came from his followers. But Prophet, early on in Mecca, you said these. We don't uh, force them. Earlier in Mecca, you said, uh, take the Jews and Christians as your friends. Now, you have other verses that are saying, don't take the Jews and Christians as your friends. And verses that are saying, make war with them. Which is it? And what was the prophet's answer? Depends. Right? Depends which house you're in. Depends if we have the upper hand or not. You see, until we understand this dualism again, we're, we're, we're going to get confused. Because the, 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 the nice Muslim shows up here and, and says, and, and many of them, by the way, are coming into churches now. And they're being invited by the pastors of the churches to say, come up here. And the Muslim stands there and says, you know, all these people that tell you Islam is peace or, or, or hateful and uh, uh, war and don't listen to them. Those are, they're all haters. I'm here to tell you Islam is peace. We love you Christians. We love you Jews. We love you non-Muslims. We're, we're supposed to love you. And you go, well, either that person is deceived or they're a... Uh, Deceiver. Is there another option? Not really, right? Think about it. Think about it. They're either deceived or they're a deceiver. They either don't know what they're doing and they're just a fool, carrying others along with them on their terrible journey, or they're deceiving. And we open the door and we let them come in. And if you watch the Chris Long video, you'll hear about stuff like pastors. I was telling pastor tonight over dinner that there's a large church in Tacoma invited their, an imam from Iran into their services. Six and a half thousand people in this church. 
Imam from Iran comes with the Quran and is telling them about how wonderful Islam is and how Jesus is esteemed. You know, we have common ground. You believe in Jesus, we believe in Jesus. And Jesus is esteemed in Islam. Six and a half thousand people give him a standing ovation. Wow. Christians in a church, because they don't know. They don't know the Jesus of the Quran is the counterfeit of the Jesus of the Bible. One is true, one is a lie. And that was what God revealed to me when I became a Christian. This gal that had, had shared her faith with me gave me a tape to listen to of a message from her church about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I listened to this thing over and over and over again until God broke my heart. And I was in my car driving and I started weeping. I had to pull over the side of the road. And I was listening to that tape and I felt like the Lord said to me in that moment, you now know the truth. One is true and one is a lie. Both of these cannot be true. Choose today whom you will serve. Can I say that to you tonight? Our message, our hope in this nation? Choose today whom we're going to serve. We need to serve the God of the Bible. We need to serve the God of, our, of, of the history of our nation. It's our only hope for getting back to anywhere. Is returning back to his principles. Restoring his commandments. Here we are in America trying to stop Sharia law from getting into our courts and our schools and our laws. And we've kicked the Ten Commandments out. We've buried them. We've dug a hole and dug them in and pounded it down. Don't ever dare talk about the Ten Commandments. But we're talking about Sharia law. When, when, when I can show you cases from the courts up to the 1950s where they were saying, without the Ten Commandments, no nation can be free. No nation can be civilized. No nation can have a right path. And where has been the church? Where has been the church shouting, you have no right to take down and tear down God's laws? Instead, we're sitting here fighting Islamic law, which I do. I, I was just recently this year in Idaho. Eight states have passed laws to try to protect their constitutions so that a judge has stopped using Islamic law. We have over 50 court cases in the United States where judges have brought in Islamic law. And we're fighting the wrong battle sometimes. But two houses, does that make sense? You get to the final house, there's no choice. There's no, there, there's no charity, folks. Moving on. Here's a few other verses. Surah 8. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Therefore, strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. Now, does the word strike off make, is, does that confuse anybody? I have people sometimes tell me, well, you're, you're, you're mistranslating these verses. You're taking them out of context. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. So that's anybody that's not a Muslim. Pretty simple, right? The infidel, the member of the house of war, strike off their necks. And that's not a karate chop. And in fact, when they would do it, historically, they would use, and in fact, today, unfortunately, and I'm not trying to be gruesome, folks, I'm just, we need to hear this stuff. Because those of you, of, of you in this room who are Christians, we have brothers and sisters who are being slaughtered. And do you know they use dull knives? Intentionally. Sir and I went through three. Oh, you who believe, Muslim, fight those of the unbelievers who are new to you and let them find you in hardness. You go, wait a second, what happened to the early verse? Ah, sir and I, remember what I said, the last chapter, this is an abrogated verse. Does that make sense? It's a latter verse. Fight believer against unbeliever. Muslim against non-Muslim. Pretty simple. I don't know what's so confusing. Surah 61.4, surely Allah loves those who fight in his way. Now, some Muslims go, well, that just means spiritual fight. That's a spiritual thing. All right. Not according with the other verses. The hadith, remember I talked to you about the extra materials, the hadith? Here's the hadith, Muslim 133. The messenger of Allah, that's Muhammad, that's the prophet, the messenger of Allah. Because remember, he's the only one who got the message, right? Remember, there's no other messengers. Like in the Bible, you know how God separated the message between the prophets and then in the New Testament between the apostles. In Islam, none of that. There's only one guy. That's it. Believe him or don't believe him. If you don't believe him, we may kill you. But, you know. I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm just telling you what, the way it is. If the messenger of Allah said, I have been commanded to fight against people until they testify that there's no God but Allah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Now, my question to you is, is there anything ambiguous about this verse? So, question. If you don't want to testify, 
Now, what is that? Remember, I, I taught you, what, what is that? What is that verse that he just said? Remember, I said, what's the prayer? The Shahada. Remember? That's the Shahada. Testified that there's no God but Allah, that Muhammad is his prophet. So, so Muhammad says, I've been commanded by Allah to fight those. This is the prophet. Remember the peaceful prophet? To fight those until they say the Shahada. My question to you is, does anybody in this room plan on saying the Shahada? I pray not. If you do, please come talk to me at the end. <laughs> and by the way, if you're ready to say and pray and ask the Lord to come into your heart, the God, of, the true God, also come talk to me or come talk to pastor, anybody else. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. Today, we must be right with God. We need Him more than ever. Bukhari, another hadith, Allah's apostle said, that's Muhammad, know that paradise is under the shades of swords. Paradise comes through the sword, the martyr, you'll see later. Now, there's many other verses I can share, but for the sake of time, we've got to move on. What is the true goal of Islam? What, what do they really want? Because remember, if, if, if the peaceful aspect is only a temporary thing, it's only to say we're in, the, in this early house until we get to the latter house. And if, if the, the sixth pillar that nobody talks about that the way they should is jihad, what's the real goal? Well, the real goal is this. It's a commandment out of the Quran. It is a commandment called ikamatu din. And that means that Islam must become can have control of the political, societal, religious, economic, every aspect of life, which is what is Sharia. Sharia law is the constitution. You heard in that video up front where one of the uh, person, I think it was Walid Shubat, who said Sharia is their government. The, the, I use the term constitution because in the United States of America, we have a constitution. So many people will argue Islam is a religion like Christianity or Judaism. That's completely false. The religious components of Sharia law are very small, and I'll, and I'll go over some of them in a minute. Sharia law is to control all of life. Economic, governmental, military, educational, society, civilly, uh, marital, every area, your food, your dietary, how you use the restroom, every area of your life is to be governed by Sharia. I'm not kidding, they actually have verses in uh, what's called the Reliance of the Traveler, which has accepted Sharia law for hundreds of years that tell you how to use the restroom. You go, well, do, do they mean that for everybody? Yes. Do you remember the definition of peace? Every nation must come under majority Muslim, get the upper hand, and institute Allah's law. By the way, every nation must also speak one language. You go, hmm, why would they only speak one language? What language are they supposed to speak? Arabic, correct? Remember, every Muslim has to learn Arabic. Has to learn to pray, at least pray. They won't fully learn Arabic. They have to learn to pray in Arabic. So you go, well, is that where they want to just, just that? They just want to make every nation that? Yeah. You know what that's called? The caliphate. That's what that term means. It's a kingdom. The word caliphate means that they want to establish a kingdom. You go, well, is that, is that new to Islam or has that been there? It's been there from the beginning. Because once Muhammad died, they had caliphs. The khalif. The caliph was the successor. He was the one who came to rule. Because Muhammad wasn't just trying to establish a religious movement. He was trying to establish an empire. Remember? Because the latter verses, right? You submit to Islam or die. In fact, the, the, the caliph that came after Muhammad, his name was Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was the caliph who came after Muhammad. He was the father of Aisha. The, the, remember the six-year-old who married Muhammad when he was uh, 47? And they consummated their marriage when he was 50 and she was nine. Abu Bakr was the caliph. He was the first caliph after Muhammad. You know what all he did for four years until he died? Until he was killed? He rounded up apostates. Because when Muhammad had gone from region to region after Islam gained prominence, he was forcing people to convert by the sword, right? So all these people after Muhammad died thought, good, we're out of here. So Abu Bakr hunts them down. 
And by some accounts, he killed between 40 and 50,000 people in four years just in that Arabic Peninsula. They had just broached up to Syria, which was once, remember, a Christian area. That's all he did was hunt down apostates. Now, why do I bring that up? The, the, the terminology of Khalifa, the idea that they are to have a global establishment, every nation under one law, Sharia, under one language, under one God, that is in the Quran and it's in the Hadith. The verses are there if you want to look them up. You go, well, what was the point of the caliphate? You see, the caliphate is offensive. Once they declare the caliphate, it's no longer a defensive struggle. After 9-11 or before 9-11, we got a video from Osama bin Laden. And the video said, we're going to attack you because you've done all these bad things. Now, I know people did think different things about 9-11, but the fact is we did get the video. And so that was a warning. But it was a defensive warning, meaning you've heard us, supposedly, so we're going to attack you. Bin Laden never declared the caliphate. Isn't that interesting? He never declared himself to be the caliph. He never said, I'm the head of Islam now. Follow me. He said, this is our defensive struggle. Until recently. You know who declared himself to be the caliphate? The head of ISIS. You see, remember Abu Bakr was the first caliph? Remember I said that? Do you know that the leader of ISIS, he changed his name to Abu Bakr? Al-Baghdadi, that's his name. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Was that an accident? He just was like, I don't know, what name should I pick? No, he picked that name because they're declaring themselves to be the caliphate. And once a caliphate is declared, they go on the offensive. That means they're going to purge. And Obama recently said, well, ISIS can't be Islamic because they're killing Muslims. <laughs> That's nonsense. Muslims have killed Muslims since the beginning. Because the devout Muslims will say to the nominal lukewarm Muslims, either follow or we'll kill you. So all that ISIS is doing by killing Muslims is saying, you either follow us or we'll kill you because we're purging. We're coming back to the true Islam, according to them. Now, some will argue that that's not the true Islam. I will argue it is because why? They're following the Prophet. Remember, what's the standard? If the Prophet did it, is it true Islam? Yes. Has to be, right? Doesn't that make sense? You got to prove to me that the Prophet never did it for me to buy the argument it's not Islam. And they can't. So if you do say the prophet did it, then they'll say, we're going to kill you. How dare you defame our prophet? We're going to kill you. You go, oh, wait a second. I thought it was supposed to be peaceful. You see, when you challenge them with the truth, the true spirit arises. The truth comes to the surface and you see what you're dealing with. You know one of those nice Muslims that you may encounter? If you ask them in love some questions about their belief, you say, how do you feel about the behavior of the prophet of Islam? See how they react. Either they'll say something like, well, I don't really know that much about it. I don't really read because that, that may be the case. Or they may get very angry. Oh, no, no, no. You can't talk about it. peace be upon him. We don't talk about the prophet. Why? Because they're, they're taught not to question the prophet. In fact, the Quran teaches them if they question the teachings of the prophet, they go to hell. Remember, Muslims are already walking around saying, I don't know how to get saved unless I become a martyr, which is what I did. I don't have any guarantee of salvation. And now if I question Islam, I go to hell. Guaranteed. Good motivation, right? Fear for controlling people. You tell me, is it Islam that is perverting people or people that are perverting Islam? Because according to all of our past governmental leaders, right? It's, it, it's the people that are perverting Islam. Islam is a good way of life. Islam is peaceful, blah, blah, blah. It's these horrible terrorists that are perverting Islam. Really? And you notice it was Republicans and Democrats. Didn't matter. People that are fooled, people that are deceived. I don't expect the President of the United States to have answers anymore. I expect the church to have answers. We have the answers. We have the Word of God. They're fools because they're not following God anymore. They've kicked them out. They don't want him anymore. And so they say foolish things like that. Foolish things. And we believe it because, well, it's the president or it's the this or it's the that. Well, they must know what they're talking about because they're the president. No, they don't know what they're talking about. Or 
Remember, they're either deceived or they're deceivers. If you find a third option, let me know, by the way. I've, I've been thinking about a third option, but I just can't think of one. To me, that's kind of the two areas. Yeah, do you have a third one? Yeah, I would like to know uh, whether Adam Bakar is uh, Sunni, Shia, or Wahhabi. He's Sunni, but they're also Wahhabi. Well, so he's funded by... So remember, Saudi Arabia plays this game. Right. They'll say, oh, no, no, we're going to fight ISIS, and yet they're supporting. I'll show you later. They're funding... So, so Saudis funded the jihadists in Syria, which is ISIS, which is where ISIS, although now we also funded them too. Shiites and the Sunnis, right. Yeah. yeah. But you see, when, it, when push comes to shove, and you see this oftentimes, Iran is Shiite Muslim. Saudi is Sunni, Syria is Sunni, so uh, ISIS is Sunni Muslim. But when push comes to shove, they work together. Iran hates Saudi Arabia. I mean, yeah, one of the things I think would happen if Iran ever got a nuke because they may nuke Saudi Arabia. <laughs> because they hate the, the, the monarchy, they hate the, the opulence. Because the Wahhabists in Saudi believe in a pure Islam, not this all big money and... They believe in a pure Islam. But the Wahhabism is a very small percentage of Islam, but they have a lot of the money. So Saudis are funding this stuff under the table and yet playing the game with us. And we go, oh, they're our allies. We shouldn't, you know, no, we, sh we should have, we should have, we should have t told Saudi, get out of our country. Saudi Arabia controls most of our media today. Even Fox News is now 18% Saudi owned. Saudi Arabia controls most of our public education in regards to funding for higher education universities with the amount of billions of dollars I've given in current grants. Saudi Arabia has ownership in textbook companies in the United States. That's why we see all these textbooks that are um, supportive of Islam. They're biased towards Islam. The very first thing we should have told Saudi after 9-11 was get out. Get out of our nation. Take your money. We don't want it. And maybe if we start drilling at home, I don't know, maybe, and tell them we don't want your oil. But that's, I got to move on. But that's a great question. And it's, it's a conundrum because it doesn't, on the surface, it doesn't make sense. But whenever you see them, when push comes to shove, they're working towards the same goal. Remember what's the same goal? The caliphate. Both the Sunnis and the Shiites believe in the caliphate. They just believe they're going to get there a different way. The Shiites, by the way, believe in the Mahdi, the Messiah, that they, that they believe is going to come from Islam. The Sunnis believe in the Mahdi. The difference is that the Sunnis believe that they're to, that once he comes, he will fully establish Islam on the earth. The Shiites believe they're supposed to cause things to make him come faster, which is why Iran is always trying to cause trouble because they believe that they're supposed to cause chaos to usher, to make it quicker. Does that make sense? But at the end of the day, they ultimately have the same goal. That's the same goal. But they'll, they'll disagree on tactics sometimes. And I'm not saying ISIS is the proper caliphate. I'm just saying ISIS has declared himself to be the caliphate. And when they do that, that's how they're justifying their purification. They're going and killing everybody, Christian and Muslims, because they're purifying Islam. Does that make sense? I got to move on here real quick. Sharia law. Now, remember, there's a lot more on this video. So I'm not going to go into this in depth tonight. If you want to learn more about Sharia, please grab this video. But basically, it's their sacred law. As I said earlier, there are religious aspects to it. They pray a certain number of times, the, 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 the food they eat, how they prepare themselves to pray for prayer, the times of year they're supposed to, to, to observe. So there are some religious components. And, and in a nation where we say, hey, we have religious freedom, I can't stop a Muslim from going in, into his house and praying five times a day. Or if he wants to eat halal meat. I can, however, get upset when Costco is selling halal meat. Or I just found out yolks. I don't know if you guys have yolks over here. We have yolks in, in Spokane. A grocery chain, they were selling lamb. And I go to buy it and I ask the butcher, is this halal? Well, oh, I don't know. What's halal? So I gave, him, gave the, the, the butcher a little, you know, the uh, gal a little education. And I had her call the company. And sure enough, the company is now halal certified. No, no labeling. See, I get upset when I see that kind of stuff. Because I think I have a right to know what I'm eating. Yeah. And so, but... To answer, to be fair, are there religious components to Sharia? Sure there are. There are. And those are components that we can allow Muslims to have in America. 
by saying, okay, go in your house in prayer, even if they want to build a mosque, as long as we know where the money came from. But when we see cities bending over backwards to allow mosques to be built, because they don't want to offend Muslims, and they'll put mosques smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood, when no church would get a permit to be in the middle of a neighborhood, even though Muslims are going to be coming to the mosque all hours of the day, including late at night. Because remember, during Ramadan, they're there until 2, 3 in the morning. Because they break their fast at sundown, and then they eat and celebrate for hours to, for the next day. So there are some religious obligations. And religious obligation, oh, by the way, Sharia deals with apostasy. I already told you that. It specifically says, under accepted Sharia law, I'm supposed to be killed. But it also deals with family. Marriage. Up to four wives. Anybody want to figure out what the one hour marriage is? That's when a Muslim can get a certificate for one hour to go have an affair, basically. The man, not the woman. It deals with divorce. A man can say to his wife, I divorce you three times. In Islam, you're divorced. Not so for the wife. The wife has to have reasons, has to have witnesses. When a wife goes into, in, into uh, a court, she has to have male witnesses. If a wife claims that her husband was assaulting her in marriage, rape, then she has to have uh, four female witnesses or two male witnesses. If a wife claims that her husband was committing adultery, she has to have male witnesses. Good luck. Yeah. Yet if a man accuses the wife of having adultery, which we just saw in Pakistan, a, a, a father stoned his own daughter because of the charge of adultery, and there was no witnesses to back her up. Because if you're charged, she's got to not come up with male witnesses. How about, unfortunately, this? As I told you, directly out of the Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari in the Hadith, it talks about the fact that Muhammad's bride, Aisha, which is why in many Islamic countries, the accepted age of marriage is usually around nine years old, eight, sometimes seven Nine, because of the example of the prophet. What he did, they follow. How about family matters, inheritance? All of that belongs to the man. The wife has no more than half the inheritance value, no more than half the testimony value. Again, if she goes into, into any court, her testimony at most is half that of the man. By the way, when Allah was asked why, he said, because the mind of a woman is deficient. <laughs> Criminal charges, punishments, theft. Adultery, murder, an eye for an eye, basically. That's why in Islam, today, in many countries, if you steal something, they'll cut off your hand, they'll cut off your feet. The apostle said, go opposite. Left to the right, opposite. Those are all, those are all Sharia law. So my question to you is, is are, are we getting the picture why we can't allow these things into our laws here in America? Because if we do, there is no longer a constitution. There is no longer a bill of rights. Now, we, we know that a lot of those are under attack anyway. But, but if Sharia law is now protected as First Amendment completely, all of our other rights are gone. There is no freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, because you're, you're going to have compulsion. How about women's rights? What women's rights? I hear this all the time from Muslims say, well, Islam liberates women. Islam protects women. What? There's no women's rights. Financial? What financial? You know what that means, financial? Sharia law deals with Muslim finances. We pass laws in the United States that allow Muslims to get special treatment. See, it's, bless you, it's forbidden for Muslims to pay um, insurance. It's considered haram, forbidden. So a Muslim... For example, can buy, um, also it's forbidden for them to pay interest. So when Muslims were getting loans, for example, for homes, they pay an upfront fee, but they don't pay interest down the road. Muslims don't have to buy Obamacare. People go, it doesn't say anything about dimitude. It's one of the nine exceptions. There's nine exceptions in Obamacare. And one of the exceptions is if your religion considers insurance to be gambling, you're exempt. That's Islam. It's in Obamacare. Political, of course, means that when a country is systematically changed with the government. This happened in Turkey. Turkey was a secular Muslim country. Through, in, through people getting elected and imposing Sharia law, it's now slowly, slowly, slowly. Some countries like Iran happened through revolution overnight. 
Some happen slowly. Turkey is now becoming a fundamental Islamic country, one of the worst abusers of human rights, and we still think, oh, it's a wonderful place because it looks secular. It's not, but it's happened through political. We now have two members of Congress in the United States that are openly Muslim, uh, Andre Carson and Keith Ellison. Keith Ellison put his hand on the Quran when he was sworn into office. He didn't take an oath in the Bible. As far as I'm concerned, he's, he's unlawfully in office. But that's what they did. Now, I want you to watch this video real quick. It's only one minute long. What a bold stance, huh? If Muslims want to have Sharia law in America, please go back to where you came from. We go, oh, oh. Now, notice the interviewer from Charlotte, the whatever that observer tried to catch him, right? What, how would you answer that question? Here's how you would, I would answer it. What law was America founded on? Common law. What was common law? Was, was natural law. What the Declaration of Independence says, the laws of nature and nature's God. Read the writing of the, most of the founders, they'll say that means scriptural law. Law in nature, law in scripture. So the nation was, this nation was founded on biblical law, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments says, honor your father and your mother. So in America, we are based on biblical law. Well, we were. So the reason we would say that it would be against God's law is because it is God's law. Now, does Islam condemn homosexuality? Yes. The difference is Islam says they must be killed. And so if Sharia law was implemented, every homosexual would be rounded up and hung in the streets like they are in Iran. In Iran, they, they take them and they openly hang them on cranes and just let them hang there. That's what Sharia law does. Because there is no humanity in it. There is no grace and mercy in it. Does that make sense? We got to move on here real quick. We still got a, quite a bit of cover, but I, I want to just cover a few more things. Remember I said to you about the verses in the Quran? That promotes death. I got to cover this because again, people don't believe me and they think we're just making stuff up. There's no guarantee of salvation but shaheed. This is a verse out of the hadith. Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal is out of the hadith. And it says the martyr has seven blessings. And it goes through the seven blessings. I'm not going to cover all of them. But notice number six. I've outlined it for you. Number six of those blessings... He will be married to 72 al hur al elim That's the virgins, right? Remember the virgins? Mm -hmm. But most people forget number seven or don't pay attention. And he, notice it says he and not she, he will be permitted to intercede for 70 of his relatives. So this is direct teaching from the prophet of Islam to the martyr. If any Muslim has the quote unquote blessing of dying as a martyr, you're guaranteed these seven blessings. That's why suicide, the family of those martyrs or those jihadists, will oftentimes throw a party. And people have asked me many times, why do they celebrate death? Here's why. Because the whole family just got to go to heaven, according to them. So your son blows himself up as a martyr, we're all in heaven. It's collective salvation. And I've had Muslims who tell me, we are disgusted by you Christians who believe that a man can die for your sins. I go, first of all, he's God who became man. Secondly, you believe that too. No, we don't. Yes, you do. No, we don't. Yes, you do. I take it to this verse. Huh? Yeah. See, they don't even know their own teaching. Right there, it says a man can intercede for 70. A man's blood can intercede for... Huh? Yes. Now, here's, here's how selfish Islam is. You only get to go for 70. Jesus Christ died for all. He loves us so much, he died for the whole world, not just Muslims. Whereas this is only for Muslims. By the way, if the martyr dies and some of his family are Christians, they don't get to go to paradise. <laughs> and we get caught up. You see, like these verses, see, we get caught up on the whole virgins, you know. Here's another verse in the Hadith about the smallest reward for the people of heaven is an abode where there are 80,000 servants and 72 Huri. 
You notice how they, you see how they recruit all these young men to fight as jihadists. You're going to get 80,000 servants and 72 virgins who, by the way, remain virgins. Don't ask me how to explain that. They remain virgins. They, that they, they just perpetuate as virgins. Sick, isn't it? Next question. Does Islam teach beheadings? Well, I already showed you a couple of verses. Here's another one. Surah 533. Talking about the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and Muhammad, his messenger, kill or crucify them and their hands, feet be cut off. You notice all the crucifixions happening in the Middle East? You go, well, this ISIS, they're such demonic, they're evil, they're terrorists. Islam would never condone that. Here's another one. Surah 812, remember? Strike them. I already read that to you. Here's the full verse of Surah 812. So strike them upon their necks. Uh, no, there's nothing ambiguous about that. Strike them upon their necks. Behead them. So when you meet those who disbelieve in battle, strike their necks until when you have inflicted slaughter upon them, then secure their bond. Now this is interesting. Have you noticed the pictures when the prisoners are beheaded? I would not recommend, and unless you really want to, to watch some of these videos. I've watched some and I will never forget them. I will never forget watching a Christian be, 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 be beheaded. But here's what I want to tell you. You notice that when they're done, they have the body laying there. They put the head on top of the back of the body and their hands are tied. They're directly following the Quran. And we don't make those connections. We go, it's a bunch of radicals. This is one of the, by the way, one of my missions is also to change this. Please, will you do me a favor? Will you not use the term radical Islam? I hear this term used all the time, radical Islam. There is no such thing as a radical Islam. It either is Islam or it isn't Islam. Those who only follow the early verses and refuse to follow the latter verses, they're not good Muslims. And you know what? Psst, when Islam takes over, they're going to be killed. They themselves will be killed because they're lukewarm Muslims. That's why ISIS is killing Muslims or Al-Qaeda or Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Now, here's the final proof of this argument. Remember I said, if I can prove to you the prophet did it, is the case closed? This is a story, Sarah al Rasul, it's one of the Sarahs, it's one of the sayings. It's a story. There's a story of a tribe called the Banu Karaizai. This is a, there was three, uh, real quick, real quick, three Jewish tribes up north in Medina. Remember, Muhammad gets more, amasses wealth and military, now goes on the warpath. He's trying to establish his kingdom. So he goes up to Medina. Outside of Medina, there was three Jewish tribes that we know of. They ran two of the tribes out. One tribe, the Banu Karaizai, would not leave. They were promised that if they paid the jizya, that they would be protected. Muhammad broke that promise. Surprise, surprise. So this is the story. Watch what it says. They were surrendered. Notice they surrendered. Unconditionally. The apostle confined them in Medina in the quarter of al Harith. Then the apostle went out to the market of Medina... And dug, dug trenches in it. Some have termed this the battle of trenches. This is historical. Then he sent for them. And what? Struck off their heads in those trenches. As they were brought out to him in batches. Tying both their hands with their necks. Isn't that what the Quran just said? Strike their necks. Bind their hands. Isn't that what the Quran said? That's what the prophet is doing. Isn't that what ISIS does? That's what the prophet is doing. So how can that be radical Islam? How can that be perverted Islam? How can we sit here and say, how dare we criticize Islam? How dare we not criticize Islam? For the sake of humanity, for the sake of liberty, for the sake of America, for the sake of Christianity, how dare we not criticize Islam? And call out what it is. For the sake of Israel too, thank you. Well, now notice, this beheading went on until the apostle made an end to them. What does that say, an end to them? What does that say? What does that mean? They were all gone. He killed all of them. He annihilated the whole thing. And what was the number? Somewhere between 600 or 700? Maybe as high as 900. Okay, let's take the low figure. 600. That doesn't include what happened to their daughters, their wives, who were taken as slaves. Sex slaves. 
The Prophet of Islam participated and supervised the mass execution of 600 Jews. Peace be upon him. We should be sitting here rebuking him and rebuking Islam. And we should be saying to Muslims, in love but with boldness, because I love you, and I know you may argue with me, you may hate me, but because I love you, I want to tell you the truth. This is not God. This is not the true way. The true God loves you. The true God has died for you so you can live for him. Think about that. In my testimony, I was taught growing up, I must die for Allah. Now I learn the true God has died for me so I can live for him and have eternal life. How can those be the same God? Moving on, moving on. We don't know if he killed all of them himself or others, but we know he participated. Here's another aspect of that same story in the Bukhari now. Remember, that was in the Syrah. This is in the Bukhari. It says, the, uh, in the War of Kaibar, Kaibar is another name for this battle of trenches. And by the way, maybe some of you paying attention in the news recently in the last few months have heard the term Kaibar. When all of the stuff was happening last, in the summer between Israel and Hamas, there was the demonstrations, uh, uh, and I don't have time to show you the video, there was demonstrations in our cities here in America sponsored by CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations, Hamas demonstration. Now remember, Hamas is on the terrorist list in America. And CARE claims that they're not having anything to do with Hamas, but yet they're having rallies for Hamas. And the people of the rallies were shouting, there was a group across the street that were Jews who were holding flags peacefully. This, this mob comes together and is shouting at them. Oh Jew, oh Jew, remember Kai Bar, remember Kai Bar. Uh, what happened at Kai Bar? Oh yeah, our prophet annihilated at least 600 of you. And he says, once again, they were shouting, the army of Allah is rising up. So what happens? Allah's apostle killed all the able men and he, and he took all the women. Now interestingly enough, one of the people he took as a sex slave was a Jewish girl and she ended up poisoning him. And that's how Muhammad died. Does Islam cause worldwide genocide? Nine out of the top ten countries killing Christians today are under the influence of Islam. The only one that's not is North Korea. Christians killed for their faith nearly doubled in 2013. Open Doors found that 20, over 2,100 Christians were killed in 2013 due to their faith. That doubled. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom said the flight of Christians out of the region is unprecedented and it's increasing year by year. There are cities now in Iraq and Syria that were Christian cities that don't have any Christians left in it. How about this disgusting thing? Selling the blood of Christians? Yes. Syrian rebels and Syria's Syrian jihadists have admitted that when they've killed Christians in that country, they've drained their blood and they sell their blood to Saudis. And Saudis have bought the blood vials for $100,000 to fund the jihad, to fund the military operation. Then they've used the blood in prayer to wash their hands. You know, there's a verse in Revelation 17 that never, never really jumped at me, could have meaning. It says that when it's talking about the mystery Babylon, and it says that this mystery Babylon will be drunk on the blood of the martyrs. Never meant anything to me until this stuff starts happening. Oh, whoa. Interesting. Anyway, there's a link if anyone wants to look it up. There's a, there's, a, there's a nun who came out of Syria who broke these stories. Horrific Horrific, horrific, demonic stories. I'm not going to go into all of them, but this is at the hand of Islam. And we go, well, what's Europe like? Remember, Europe is in the throes of Dar al-Islam. Here's some examples. Belgium, for example. Little tiny Belgium, you know, with the tulip field. Isn't that Belgium? Holland, you know. Belgium now, for the fourth year in a row, Mohammed is the number one baby name. 40% of children in the schools in, in Belgium are now Muslim. They are predicting by 2013... There will be a 50 plus percent majority of Muslims in Belgium in 16 years. Muslims now have political parties in Belgium and other countries. And when their candidates are running, they're not hiding anything. They're saying, we're going to implement Sharia. We're going to segregate men and women. We're going to bring in halal food because they already have halal food in most of the schools. 
Uh, Great Britain has over 85 Sharia compliant courts. France has over 751 no-go zones. You see these enclaves that are forming, like in Dearborn, Michigan, where you go in there, they're, go they're being governed by Sharia. This is happening in, in many European cities where you go into these suburbs and they have signs up saying Sharia zones. And if you go in there as a Westerner, as a non-Muslim, good luck. Because police don't even sometimes go in there. Islam is segregating, demanding Sharia. Now my question to you is, why did that happen? Because Islam, or Europe said, we're going to have multiculturalism. We're going to have political correctness. We're going to be a melting pot. You see, Islam doesn't want to melt. Islam comes to segregate and then dominate. Because they're commanded. Remember their commandment? They commit to deen. They must establish Islamic law. So first they segregate. And the stronger they get, the more they demand. Eventually, they will dominate. That's their plan. That's their goal. And Europe, Europe, pop population, immigration, the birth rate in Europe, the lowest country's birth rate of Muslims is about five. Five per family. Because remember, they're also allowed to marry up to four wives. The average European birth rate is 1.35, 1.4. That's not enough to sustain their culture. So numerically, it's a matter of time, unless the church, the, 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 the church that is like minuscule in Europe, the, the remnant church, unless they wake up and unless God intervenes, Europe will become Eurabia. It's just a matter of when. And America's headed on that path. And by the way, when we talk about America, one of the reasons we talk about Sharia law, the reason we talk about it's not conducive, because Sharia law violates all five sections of the First Amendment. Freedom of religion? There is none. I showed you. When Islam takes the upper hand, they demand. You don't have freedom of religion. How about freedom of speech? Nope. You can't criticize Islam. You can't say anything unless they kill you. How about freedom to assemble? Nope. You can't assemble freely. How about freedom of the press? <laughs> nope. How about freedom of addressing your grievances against your Islamic government? Good luck. If you want to try that, I buy you a ticket to Iran. Good luck. Let me know how that works for you. This is what we're talking about. But again, we can't have these honest dialogues about it. Now, lastly, before I just want to show, because I had a couple more videos I got to show you, because I, I want to briefly touch on the Muslim Brotherhood, and then we're going to stop for questions. Because I want to talk about with you, what do we do? Right? Because I don't want to just be here and be like, okay, everything's bad, let's go home, bye-bye. We want to talk about what can we do? What are the solutions? And, and, I, and I tell you, number one solution is on our knees. Is on our knees before the true God, repenting. Father, forgive us for what we have done and allowed in this nation. Forgive us that we have so, so been against you and so allowed ourselves to come against you that the only hope we have of pushing our enemies out, because here's my question to you, is, now hear, hear what I say, is Islam, Islam, a threat to America? Yes. Absolutely. I didn't say Muslims, because I think there's some Muslims that can live here. And like Franklin Graham, I would say to some Muslims, feel free to go back. I have no problem. I'm not going to be hurt if you decide to go back to Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or uh, an African country or Iran or wherever they operate their Sharia. Go ahead. But, yeah, maybe, maybe Europe... But we have to repent. We have to pray and ask God. See, when I read the scriptures, there was only one way that Israel turned. And that was when God did. When they got to the point when they had enough. You remember when God gave Israel a king? You want a king? Here you go. I'm, I'm putting before you, God's given America a king. John Kerry said, Islam is peaceful religion based on the dignity of all human beings. ISIL or ISIS is not the real face of Islam. Hmm. Obama said, ISIS is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents. By the way, in Islam, the term innocence is used for Muslims. Muslims, they're innocent. Remember, non-Muslims, they're the kuffar. They're excrement. Obama, while celebrating Eid al-Fitr, remember the end of Ramadan, said in the United States, now remember, listen to this. Because I'm going to give you, apparently, according to the president, a history lesson, which I didn't know. See if you knew this one. In the United States, Eid 
also reminds us of the many achievements and contributions of Muslim Americans to building the very fabric of our nation and strengthen the core of our democracy. Did you know that they were a part of building America? I didn't know this. Yeah, w w did I miss a history lesson somewhere? I think the president needs to learn the right history lesson. You see, Islam was a part of the beginning of America. Anybody know how? Barbary Park. Very good, sir. The Barbary Wars. Islam was our first enemy. Before we fought the War of England in 1812, we were fighting the War of the Barbary Pirates. And it was after diplomacy failed because at that time, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and Patrick Henry, I believe it was, were diplomats. They were going over there trying to find a peaceful solution. Let's, let's negotiate. And they kept making these treaties. And the, and the Barbary pirates from Tunisia and Morocco and Libya and those countries kept breaking the treaties. So finally, Thomas Jefferson got a Quran. That's how he got a Quran, by the way. <laughs> Not because the president said he, he esteemed Islam. No, you know, he got the Quran, he read it, and he understood jihad for the first time. So then you know what he did? He created the Marines. That's why in the Marine song, there's that shores of Tripoli wording. Our very first army was created, the Marines, for Islam. And he sent the Marines, and he said his famous quote, not one more penny to tribute and every dime to defense. I think that's the guts that we got to get in America again. And understand that this has to be, we have to understand the threat to our nation. But, 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 if God is judging this nation, the, the, the fence is not going to be closed until we repent. Because I read my Bible, folks, and Israel did this many times. And every time Israel rejected God, God said, okay, you don't need me? I'll remove my hand and your enemies are going to come in and lay waste. When they repented, when they turned back to him, he comes in. And you know what? Not only does God, he's so gracious, not only does he restore the Israel, he got rid of the enemies. You go, well, that's pretty harsh. Well, the future is pretty harsh, isn't it? The future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam, according to the president after the Benghazi attack. And recently, the President of the United States said that the Muslim Brotherhood, there's no evidence. He said just a week and a half ago, there's no evidence that they are a violent group. No evidence in their history. If you get this DVD, you'll see I spell out the history of the Muslim Brotherhood. Going back to 1928 when they were reformed after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Hassan al-Banna was their founder. You know who, who he was friends with? Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Albano was an ardent admirer of Hitler. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. This guy, Haj al Amin al, al, al Amini. He inspected SS troops. Two SS troops in the Nazi war machine were Muslim. One in North Africa, one in Bosnia. The history of the Brotherhood, political assassination. They cared, uh, remember Anwar al Sadat? And do you know that the President of the United States right now with Hillary Clinton? The charges have been brought up against them in Egypt. Watch this. Uh, I'm going to show you this very quick bit video. This is all I just said. There's this Haj Amin al Husseini, Grand Mufti, inspecting the troops. They started the Brotherhood. Do you know that the Brotherhood then started groups like Hamas in 1988? No evidence of violence. None, according to the President of the United States. None. Even though Hamas is a terror group. But there's no evidence of connection. Even though there was a trial where, where five members of the Brotherhood went to jail on 108 counts with supporting Hamas. There's no evidence, according to the president. You don't think this is propaganda? You see, remember I said, you're either a deceived man or you're a deceiver. You pick which one. But you're one of those two. You know, so during the Hitler salute, that's a common thing with the Islamic jihadist organizations. They will do Hitler salutes. I saw this in Iran growing up all the time. The, the Hezbollah armies would come up on the streets and march and do Hitler salutes. And unless you understand this, this bizarre connection, you go, what? You understand? No evidence, according to the president. CARE, MSA, ISNA, all these groups, all these groups fronts for the Muslim Brotherhood. 
I gotta move on here. I'm not gonna cover some of the stuff for time because I think you guys know that America is being breached. The White House, oh, they love to visit the White House. The Muslim Brotherhood is four blocks in the White House now. Hanging out all the time with the president. Watch this video and we'll end with this and then we'll take questions. It has been revealed that the Obama regime has an extremely close yet secret relationship with the ousted Muslim Brotherhood regime of Mohammed Morsi. This is in Egypt. Using extensive we go documents a little bit and on the testimony, right. Egyptian lawmakers have submitted a criminal complaint naming Barack Obama as an accessory to the Muslim Brotherhood's crimes against its own citizens. You hear what you said? Per the complaint, Obama, quote, cooperated, incited, and assisted the armed elements of the Muslim Brotherhood in the commissions of crimes. These crimes include murder, rape, torture, even ethnic cleansing, specifically the mass murder of Egyptian cops, Christians. Documents have also surfaced showing the Obama regime was secretly funneling millions of dollars to high-ranking Muslim Brotherhood members, ostensibly charged with rounding up and killing anyone who opposed the Mohammed Morsi regime, which included the crucifixion of Christians. In a second criminal complaint submitted to Egypt's Attorney General Hisham Barakat on December 13, 2013, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has been named as a collaborator with the wife of Mohamed Morsi, Nagla Ali Mahmoud, in seeking to overthrow the current leader of Egypt, General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Morsi's wife has said openly on Turkey's Anatolia News that the Clinton relationship has gone back decades to the 1980s when Nagla Ali Mahmoud was living in the United States. Per Mahmoud, she is in possession of hundreds of telephone recordings that include Clinton and other unnamed officials in the White House. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. As widely reported in Egyptian media, Barack Obama, with Clinton's help, secretly bribed the Muslim Brotherhood with a staggering $8 billion to guarantee that the huge tract of land, the Sinai Peninsula, be turned over to the Muslim Brotherhood sister group, Hamas. Signatories to this agreement include Obama, Mohamed Morsi, and Hirat al shatur the second in command in the Muslim Brotherhood hierarchy, under arrest along with Mohamed Morsi. Hirat al shatur states that he is in possession of additional documents that will land our president, Barack Obama, in prison. Why would Barack Obama want the Sinai Peninsula turned over to the terrorist group Hamas? Hamas has vowed to annihilate the Jewish people down to every last man, woman, and child. Being in possession of the Sinai Peninsula would have put Israel in an indefensible position, leading to their destruction. If the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood had not been locked up and Hamas driven out of Egypt, the Jewish people surely would have been annihilated. Hitler's final solution would finally have been realized. I just want you to understand the scope. In Egypt, they have formally brought up charges against the President of the United States and the sec former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on charges of aiding and abetting their enemy and on being operatives of the Muslim Brotherhood. Why don't we know this? And why aren't we pursuing these charges? Because if these charges are true, it's treason. It's not just impeach, it's treason. This is a, we're talking about the leadership of our nation aiding and abetting our uh, enemy and helping to overthrow the government of another nation by putting in the brotherhood. Remember when, when they ousted um, Morsi, the military, the United States cut off funding to Egypt. When the brotherhood was there, they supported the brotherhood with funding, with money. The United States supported the rebels in Syria. You know how they supported the rebels in Syria? by running guns through Libya. Yeah. You remember Benghazi? Yeah. The secret hidden in Benghazi, and on our radio show, I do a radio show weekly on the issue of Islam with a friend of mine, co-host Tom Wallace. We inter interviewed a, a reporter by the name of Ken Timmerman who's been studying Iran for 40 years. 
And Ken Timmerman said that Iran had a hand in Benghazi and that part of the reason the whole story about the YouTube video came out is because they knew that there was guns being run from Libya to Syria to the rebels by the CIA and they had to hide those. They could not have that story come out because it would have caused an absolute impeachment of the president. By the way, who were the rebels in Syria today? ISIS. So we, we as a nation, were running guns to now ISIS. This is blood that's on our hands, folks. You don't think God sees this? Beyond all the other things that, that this nation has done. Now, by the grace of God, we're standing. And so as I wrap up tonight, I want to say again, there's so much more I can share with you. And there's not enough time. Pray for Israel. It breaks my heart. I see so many churches turning on Israel. Supporting the Palestinians, Hamas. There is no Palestine. There is no Palestine in scripture, folks. Palestine was a derogatory term given. Palestine was never mentioned. Show me one verse in the scripture where Palestine was mentioned as a nation once. There isn't. You won't find it. But was Israel given covenant land by God? Absolutely. If you don't believe it, you got to read your scriptures. Israel was given covenant. In fact, you can argue that covenant land that God gave to Israel extends to Saudi Arabia. That's a whole other discussion for a different time. But my point is this. Pray for Israel. Pray for our nation. Pray that we as God's people. See, I can stand up here and, and give you solutions. Go to your school system and fight textbooks in the schools. Contact your lawmakers. Support American laws for American court. Those are all viable things. By the way, a, a good group out there is Act for America. I work with them off and on. They're a good group that's, that's practically trying to fight some of the aspects of Islam as Islamization here in America. Um, uh, their website is on my website. If you go to tiltproject.com, tilproject.com, uh, under resources, you'll see Act for America. I have amazing friends that I work with to reach out to Muslims. I believe the church must equip itself to properly evangelize Muslims. So if you're part of a church in this area and you want support, if your church wants support, talk to me. I'm in contact with ministries that do an incredible job without compromise of training missionaries and churches to do outreach to Muslims, how to prepare them ap uh, apologetically, how to prepare them to answer the questions that Muslims may have. It's not an excuse for us not to engage Muslims because we're afraid or maybe intimidated by it. By the way, there's nothing intimidating. If you share your testimony and the gospel with a Muslim, you can never go wrong. Share your testimony in Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ and let God do his part. Don't manipulate the message. Let him do it. It's his power. It's his glory. But we in this nation must recognize we've been breached. And we've been breached because God has been mocked. And he's been forgotten. Now, yes, in the church, we're here. we worship him every week and praise God. But we need more. We need more of God's people to fall on their knees and say, Father, not just mercy, but justice. You see, we always want to pray for mercy, don't we? But what about justice? God operates in both, doesn't he? After all, why was the cross necessary? Why did I convert to Christianity? Because I recognize I'm a sinner. I've fallen short of the glory of God. I, I can't meet the glory of God except through Christ. So God in his mercy sent his son. In his justice took the, pay, the life of his own son. God himself paid that price. That's an amazing God. Islam doesn't operate in mercy. Islam only operates in brutality because it is demonic. It is a spirit that is against God. Don't buy the notion out there in the churches that it's the same God. Oh, it's, we have common. Oh, let's just have kumbaya. Oh, don't buy that. That's deception leading you astray. Please don't go there. Stay true to God. Stay true. But pray for our nation. I believe scripturally we can make the argument... God has given America the king that we wanted. We don't want God. God has given us a king. You don't think we have a dictator for me? You don't think we have a dictatorship? I said this in 2012 during the campaign. And people thought I was nuts. 
that we're on the verge of a dictatorship. Oh my gosh, that guy is crazy. Oh boy, go hang around that guy. I just said what I felt God told me to say on my heart. But we have to repent. We have to turn. We got to pray. We got to be bold. Please. And it starts in the church. It starts with us. If we are willing to do it, what can God do with a small few? We don't need thousands, right? Amen? We don't need thousands. This many people in this region can rock this area. I believe it with all my heart. If, you, if, if, if we come together in unity of the Spirit and in the pursuit of the truth and the pursuit of God and the pursuit of turning our nation back. So I believe it's possible. But we, we're, 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 we're in deep trouble. But we've got to recognize that this is a threat not only to the nation but to Christianity itself. And so Islam wants to stamp out Christianity. We have to recognize it's spiritual. It's, we don't fight flesh and blood. We, but, but at the same time, we are fighting a real enemy. So with that...